for, um, for the invitation. Um, this is work which has been going on uh, for quite a few years. Um, uh, those are my collaborators. The ones in red uh, are uh, postdocs who are looking for permanent positions. Uh, if you see their names uh, at when you have postdoc applications. David Thornton used to be in red, but uh, two weeks ago he got a um, Royal Society Fellowship, so he moved to the black, uh, he moved to the black uh, part. <laughs> but those guys are still in the market, so um, you know, when you have money and you want to get postdocs, you know, go for them. This is all the places which uh, have, have given us uh, money. It's quite a few people and quite a few places. So I'll begin very fast because most of you know a bit about, uh, about string theory. So more than 20 years ago, Stromager and Wafa did a very nice calculation. They looked in string theory in a regime of parameters where black holes don't exist, gravity is zero, but some system which has some charges um, has the right properties to become a black hole when gravity is turned on. And the system of strings and brains, they just took these strings and brains and they computed their entropy. And they found, en they, they found a certain entropy. And then they said, okay, let's turn on gravity. And when you turn on gravity, the system of strings and brains actually becomes a black hole. And then the entropy of this, the entropy of the system of strings and brains matches the entropy of the black hole. So this is a very nice uh, calculation. And again, it's not, it's not a calculation uh, which is just you know, matching you know, five equals to five, numbers equals to numbers. This is really like you know, hypergeometric functions and like you know, modular forms equal modular forms. You do two calculations in two very different parts of physics and you get the same answer. It's clearly something, something um, shocking and amazing if you, if you think about it. So this entropy matching, again, is one of the big successes of string theory. And again, there have been about 2,000 papers uh, writing continuations of this, um, on this work. Now, there's a, no more, there's a more subtle question which you can ask, which has to do more with what do we were discussing yesterday and you know, the theme of this workshop and, and the information paradox, which is, OK, great. I have a nice calculation of the entropy of a statistical ensemble. But I can ask a more refined question. What's happening if I take one particular microstate in this ensemble? I don't care about the ensemble. I don't care about, uh, about ensembles. I just want one particular microstate of this in, in this ensemble. And I want to understand what's happening when you increase the coupling and you go when you turn on gravity, when you make gravity finite. And the standard law has been, again, for many years, following work by Saskin, Horvitz Polchinski, Thibault, and Gabriele Veneziano, the standard law has been that you know, this configuration of strings and brains, when you turn on gravity, um, brains become smaller. Gravity is an attractive force. Why not? Gravity makes things smaller. Uh, the horizon, on the other hand, grows with gravity, so the horizon becomes bigger. There's a correspondence point. And then you recover the standard black hole. So there's an expectation that you know, the system, e each and every particular microstate which Stroman and Vapa counted, when you go to strong coupling to find a gravity becomes something which, you know, which looks like a black hole, has a horizon, and you know, it's basically indistinguishable from a black hole outside of the horizon. However, over the past you know, almost 12 years, it has been 12 years, um, it's hard to, hard to fathom, uh, we have discovered that some of the Stromage of Alpha microstates, not all of them, not the typical one, just some of them, they have no intention of developing a horizon. Rather, when you go to the black hole regime of parameters, they become something like this. They become some geometries which have the same asymptotics as the black hole. They have the same throat as the black hole. But instead of having a horizon, they have a smooth cap. And each and every microstate which you consider goes into a configuration which, again, looks like a black hole asymptotically, but doesn't have a horizon. Instead, it has a smooth cap. And the question which one can ask, again, given, by, given the existence of these solutions, and you know, we have quite a few of these solutions uh, by now, the question is, uh, which one can ask is, is it possible that all the black hole microstates, all the microstates of the black hole which, give, which contribute to the entropy, they actually look like this. They are this kind of microstates, which are, again, horizonless configurations. And the black hole, therefore, would be thought of not as a fundamental description of the, of, of the physics, but rather as a coarse grain approximation. And the real description of the physics is given by these microstates. In a sense, the, and this is again, this was first put, put forth by Matur. It goes under the name of Fosberg proposal, but again, it has, many, it, has many other name, it has many other names. But in a sense, what it implies, if you think about an ideal gas, if you think about an ideal gas and you want to make an analogy, when you have an ideal gas, you can describe the ideal gas in two ways. You can describe it using fluid mechanics. You know, PV equals NRT, just treat the gas as a continuous fluid. If you want to fly airplanes, you know, you don't care too much about the fact that the air is made of molecules and so on and so forth. You just need to know um, some, uh, some um, heat capacities. So you can describe the air as, an ideal, as, as a fluid, and you know, it works very well. However, if you want to do short noise experiments, if you want to do, you know, if you want to look at, you know, the, the universe at, you know, very, very dilute plasmas, you know that the air is not made of 
a, a continuous fluid, the arrangement of molecules zooming around this room at you know, 200 and something kilometers an hour, and that's a real composition of the air. So even if fluid mechanics is very good, and you know, again, if you want to ventilate yourself, you know, use fluid mechanics, you don't care about the molecules, um, the, un the, understanding, the, the air is really made of molecules. And again, you have many, many states. So you know, again, the air in this room can be in many states. We are right now in a typical state, hopefully. Uh, but you know, the air can go very well in the corner, and all the molecules can go to the corner of that room, and you know, we can all die. It can happen. Okay, it's a very less, it's, it's a very small chance for this to happen, but you know, it can happen. So, but we know that this is the, this, this this is what this is what the room is made of. It's made of this kind of molecules. And what we are trying to argue is that the black hole, in a similar fashion, the black hole solution, the one you find in nice, beautiful in, in the GR textbooks. The one which, which again, you get, you, you read in the, you, you, you read in the textbooks. The black hole solution is basically going to be a thermodynamic description of the physics, a fluid mechanical description of the physics, which is very good if you want to do gravitational lensing and you know far away behavior, and you know if, if you want to understand the physics far away from the horizon, it's a it's a perfect description. Again, you know much like fluid mechanics is very good for flying airplanes, but if you want to do near horizon physics, if you want to do, if you want to understand, for example, information loss. You cannot use fluid mechanics. You have to use this new description in terms of microstate geometries. And if you want to address, for example, information loss and maybe even gravity waves, you have to actually, physics which happens very near the horizon, you actually have to use this description. Now, it's very possible that the scale where fluid mechanics, so the, and the question is, you know, what, 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 one of the questions would be, you know, where does uh, start, uh, fluid mechanics break down? So, you know, you, you know when you have the air, when you go to the, at the scale of the mean free path, Fluid mechanics breaks down. The question is, you know, does fluid mechanics break down at the horizon or further out, or maybe breaks, maybe the horizon is still, is still captured by fluid mechanics. So this is this is really the big this is really the big um, the big question. So now the question is, uh, th there are some other ways of thinking about this um, this um, what they're trying to say. So if this is true again, if the black hole microstates uh, microstates are given by these geometries, then in a sense. We can say that the effective, the, the effective field theory describing the black hole breaks down at the horizon. There will be new physics coming out there, and there's no space time inside black holes. Again, this is another way to, say what, to, to rephrase what I'm saying. Inside black holes, you don't have actual space time. You have, a, you have a superposition of geometries which does not look, which does not have, which does not, which does not crystallize in, into space time. So that's basically another way of saying it. Uh, there's another. If, if you know about ADS-CFT, many of you are holographists, and you know m many of you do ADS-CFT, and you know know ADS-CFT better than uh, you know. They're more handy with ADS-CFT than you know other other than other, other things. In ADS-CFT, you have the boundary theory, which has some states, and there's an ensemble description of the states. Strom and Javafa match the ensemble with the black hole. They say that you know basically every you know the entropy here is is given by the entropy here. What I'm trying to show is that each and every one of one of the states in the boundary is due to some horizonless configurations. And therefore, the black hole is, again, the thermodynamic description of these horizonless configurations. Now, the, what I want to emphasize is that this, this, is, this is not some hand-waving idea. This is, not, this is something which one can really establish by like, you know, hardcore calculations in string theory. This is not you know, something which, OK, I like it, you know, it's beautiful, and you know, let's say it's true. This is something which you can really do. You really have to do a lot of hardcore calculations in string theory to show, to show that it's true. Now, a word of caution. Ever since Hawking came up with the information paradox, many, many people have tried to say, let's solve the information paradox by replacing the black hole by something. A black hole soliton, or a gravel star, or you know, people want to have you know, firewalls nowadays and start hovering around the, above the horizon. You know, people in, in loop quantum gravity, even they have some Penrose diagrams involving some loop quantum gravity stuff, which again sits, um, which, which actually sits again at, at the horizon scale. There are many, many people who are trying to replace the black hole by something. This would be a very simple solution, you know, very simple solution to the information paradox. It will solve the information paradox in five seconds. But the problem is, uh, again, as um, um, as we saw yesterday, it's, it's, this, this is very difficult. It's very difficult to do that. And if you want to do that, you have to satisfy three very stringent tests. And that's something which Gary Horowitz explained to me. And you know, I think it's you know, it's one of the it's one one of the um, very deep things about about this stuff. First of all, if you want to replace the black hole horizon by something, you have to the, the something you are using has to have the same growth with G Newton as the black hole horizon. Why am I saying that? If you look at the black hole size. And you imagine making a Duncan experiment by which you increase G Newton. You are God, you are playing with the constants of the universe, and you increase G Newton. You make G Newton stronger. Then the gravity, th then the black hole horizon becomes bigger. This is the only thing in the universe which becomes bigger when gravity, in, in our universe, when gravity becomes stronger. Normally, gravity be becoming stronger, you know, 
tends to collapse things. You know, gravity is an attractive force. You make gravity stronger, you attract more, you make things smaller. So whatever you're replacing the black hole with has to grow with G Newton with the same, with, and, and exactly with the same rate as, as the black hole horizon. And that's something, again, very, very hard. And you know, if you just, again, build your favorite theory of quarks and you know, you know, grab stars and stuff like that, the, whatever you build is going to become smaller with G Newton. Now, with the black hole microstates, I'm going to explain you, I'm going to, to, to tell you about, they do grow with G Newton. And there's a very nice mechanism having to do with, that, with the fact that you are using, to, to build them, you are using D brains. D brains are, in a sense, half solitonic objects. They have a tension which grows, which goes like one over G string. And the D brain, because it's a solitonic object, it actually becomes lighter when G Newton becomes bigger. And because the D brains become lighter, there are some centrifugal forces. And given some angular momentum or configuration of D brains, because the D brain is lighter, it actually becomes bigger. So the ingredients which we are using, again, to replace the black hole, involve D brains, involve solitons, inv involves objects which have tension, which goes like one over G string. And this is actually what makes these guys ab able to replace the horizon. Otherwise, again, if you just use, want to use normal matter, you cannot do it. This is test number one. Test number two is that you have to have a, me a mechanism to uh, no, not to fall into the black hole, and that's very difficult. As, uh, as was explained to us yesterday, if you want to put something, again, imagine the Penrose, di the Penrose diagram, I'm just having a cut of the Penrose diagram, this is the black hole, this is the inner horizon, this is the outer horizon, you want to put some stuff, you want to put some structure, you want to put some garbage living here. But there's a problem, again, there's a GR dogma that the horizon, you should not put anything at the horizon, and the reason is very simple. The horizon is a null surface. If you want to put something there, you have to go with the speed of light. If whatever you're putting there is massive, if it involves you know, anything massive, any, any, any particles or anything, it just falls in. Massive stuff doesn't want to go with the speed of light, just wants to go like this, so it will fall into the black hole immediately. So the black hole horizon really flashes inside it anything which you want to try, try to put there naively. If it's a massless object, then you can solve the wave equation in the black hole solution. Again, it's a, it's, it's a textbook exercise. You solve the wave equation, you find that wh whatever wave profile you put there, the black hole is going to eat it up very fast. In a crossing time, it's gone. So whatever massless profile you want to put there, it dilutes very fast and you know, it's gone. So you cannot put stuff there. You cannot just say, oh, I'm putting something at the horizon and I'm showing the, 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 the black hole entropy. This doesn't work. The horizon is null. You cannot have stuff living there. No membrane, no spins. If you say, oh, I'm explaining the black, the, the black hole entropy by putting a spin at the horizon up and down, as, as Jose was, say, was saying yesterday, you know, okay, it's a nice picture and so on and so forth, but these spins, you know, they are made of something and they just fall in. Whatever you want to put there, whatever your, your, your favorite theory wants to put at the horizon, is going to fall in. And again, same goes for the firewall. And again, if you just say something must be there, you have to find a support mechanism. And that's something which is really, really difficult. And, and, and the reason is very, is, is very easy. If you, don't have a and if you don't have a support mechanism, this object is going to fall in. And most of the, of the normal stuff is going to fall in. If you don't have a support mechanism, again, it's really that you know, whatever you are doing is just, is just, not, is just, is just not right. Number three is even worse. If you think about gravitational collapse, there's a lot of paper from Oppenheimer and Schneider back from 39, which considered the shell of dust coming in and forming a horizon. So let's suppose you have a shell of dust which is you know, huge, which has the mass of the galaxy. And the shell of dust is collapsing. And at some point, the shell of dust goes into the region which is basically within its Schwarzschild radius. And let's say this is the region here, so I have a huge shell of dust. You know, this is supposed to be a shell of dust which has the mass of the galaxy of, the, of a huge size. I'm letting it collapse. At some point, the shell of dust is collapsing and it's forming a horizon. At that moment, the curvature of space-time around the place where the horizon forms is very, very small. Again, if you take the black hole as, uh, which, has the size of, uh, which has the size of the galaxy, it's one of the things which Don didn't tell us yesterday, you know, when you cross the horizon of the black hole, which is the size of the, which, has the, which is the one in the, in the middle of the galaxy, what's the force you feel? This is one of the scales of the black hole, and you know, Don didn't tell us yesterday how much is the tidal force, but these forces are going to be very small. You know, you can have, if, if you make a mega big black hole, the, gra the, the tidal forces and the force which, which an observer feels when going through the horizon, Whatever, wh whatever sheer tidal forces they feel, they're going to be smaller than gravity on the Earth. And gravity on the Earth we trust, we don't need to invoke you know, quantum gravity and strings and so on and so forth. So you expect that whenever the shell of dust is collapsing, you're going to form very nicely a black hole, you know, there's no problem, you'll form a horizon, and then you'll keep collapsing. 
and you'll keep collapsing, and you'll keep collapsing. And at some point, the shell of dust is going to become very small, very crumpled, very stringy. There are going to be non-perturbative effects, deep brains, and stuff like that. And that's going to be here, in this red region. So you'll collapse the shell, you'll form a horizon very happily. And then at some point, again, you'll collapse, you know, you, you'll have some stringy effects, and you know, you know, stuff is going to become high curvature, and so on and so forth. You'll have, you have to throw away the theory, and you have to invoke a new theory. But then what you're trying to do, you are trying to build something on the horizon. You're trying to build some firewall. You're trying to build some structure, again, at the, on the horizon. You have to convince this stringy red stuff here to give rise to this stuff here. But as you see here, this is backwards in time. So somehow, if you have a shell of dust and you're collapsing it, you're going to form stringy matter. You have to go back one million years in time to form this structure at the scale of the horizon. There is no. And you know, so, so essentially, by the time the shell becomes curved enough for, for quantum effects to, take to, 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 become, to become important, the horizon and all the structure you could, which you could be is, is, in, is in the causal path. So this thing has to come out, out, of, out, out of nowhere. And this cannot happen. I mean, again, you have, to you, you have to go back one million years backwards in time to create this structure. So creating a structure at the horizon is, again, not very easy. How can you do it? How can you go backwards in time? The only mechanism to do that, and again, this is one of the, one, this, this is one of, one of the big uh, counterarguments to whatever people want to do, you know, firewalls and fastballs, whatever people want to do at the horizon. The only way to convince this shell of dust to give rise to this structure is to actually make it tunnel. And this is an argument very nice by, by Per Krauss and Samir Matur, which then we made the very, which, which actually we competed explicitly for some class of microstate geometries. If you look at the black hole, the black hole has e to the s microstates, and let's suppose the picture I'm, I'm telling you about is correct. You are, you know, let's, let's suppose I'm able to build e to the s microstates of the black hole. Now, the tunneling, if I have a shell of dust, the, 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 the shell of dust can tunnel into these microstates. It's a very complicated process. I mean, a, a microstate is, is a stringy thing, so, you know, the shell of dust has to go over a huge barrier, but one can estimate the height of this barrier, one can estimate how big is the tunneling probability, and it's going to be heuristically over the e to the minus s. That was the argument by Krauss and Matur. And in the calculation we did involving some supersymmetric and near supersymmetric solutions, we found it to, to actually be a, sli a slightly big, uh, bit higher. So then actually what's happening, you have a shell of dust. You have e to the minus e to the s possible tunneling endpoints. And the probability to tunnel into each and every one of them is e to the minus s. And therefore, when you have the shell of dust collapsing, it will actually tunnel by the Fermi Golden Rule with probability 1. So the shell of dust, again, if you have e to the s horizon-sized microstates, by the time the shell of dust crosses the horizon, it can tunnel into, in, in, into all of them, and the tunneling probability will be 1. And you'll not go here. You'll form immediately. One, once you're here, you'll tunnel, and you'll form this structure. This is the only way. This is the only way to form this kind of firewall fastball structure without going backwards in time. It has to be by tunneling. So if you want to replace, so if you want to replace the black, hole horizon, the black hole horizon by something, you know, if, you know, if you want to build a structure there, if you want to say, OK, I'm building a structure, it's not enough to just give me one solution, or two solutions, or five solutions, or 20 solutions. You have to give me e to the s solutions. You have to give me e to the s configurations, which are horizon-sized. If you don't give me this e to the s configurations, if you only build you know, one or two or three solutions, it is, this will not be enough. This, will, I mean, this, this, this doesn't mean that these solutions are going to be here. You, you, you'll not see the structure. you just have a horizon. So again. The, the stakes are very high. If you want to replace the black hole horizon by something, you really have to do all these three things. You really have to build something which grows with gravity, which uh, stays, stays at the horizon and, and, and doesn't fall in. And moreover, it has a huge entropy. You, you have to build e to the s of those things in order to argue that you can replace the horizon. If you just build one of them, it, 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 it's not going to be enough. So maybe it's a good place if people have questions. This is, in a sense, the motivation, and this is the stakes of, 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 of what you're doing. What yeah. about adding the criterion of being non-BPS, very far from BPS? The same, the same. If you want to argue that, no, that, that, that far from BPS, you have to find e to the s non-BPS solutions. Uh, yes, yes, no, but I mean, can you satisfy this? I'm coming. It, half of the talk is about, is about that. Half of the talk is about supersymmetric, half about no, about, about non-supersymmetric, so. Uh, if we consider a, a shell, a collapsing shell in ADS, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, this mechanism should happen immediately after the formation of the horizon? So, in particular, that uh, I think whatever th whatever mm -hmm. whatever theory you are having, again, if you have a black hole, there should be to the s microstates. If these microstates have horizon size, this th 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 this can happen. 
you know, it's just, it, 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 I mean, okay, the calculation we did about the tunneling and, you know, when we found, so again, this number, this was estimated by Krauss and Matur using some black holes and using, again, some heuristic arguments, but we had really microstates which we built, and then we computed the tunneling probability, you really, you know, you have a brain going over some potential, we really calculated this potential, and we found this number a tiny bit more, so somehow you are forming this, you are forming this microstates a bit before forming the horizon. We, we found that this number is not really to the minus heads, there's, an, there's another big prefactor in front, so you're actually tunneling a bit before the horizon forms. Yeah, just uh, you mentioned the uh, golden Fermi rule, mm -hmm. but it, it, has, it, it doesn't have to do with tunneling, it has to do just with uh, evolution. Emission. But it also works for tunneling. So if I have e to the s possible endpoints and e to the minus s chance of going into one of them, then it's the full. The it's the transition probability, yeah. It's not for me golden rule, okay. Fair enough. I'm sorry, just to go back to my question. I think in ADS th there is some evidence that. Uh, if you form a non spasmatic black hole by the collapse of the shell, then at least uh, before the black hole gets very old, mm -hmm. there is an interior which is given by the source of solution and not uh, mm -hmm. a microscope. But it depends on the tunneling. Again, you know, one, one, one would have to compare the tunneling. So in ADS, I mean, in the ADS 5. Because no, it's 5 from the safety point and from the safety mm -hmm. calculation. But that's, a po that's the whole point. In the safety calculation, this is just thermalization. And, and the question is, you know, when you thermalize, What's the mechanism for thermalization? If I put a blob and, 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 and so on. And if, if you think about thermalization, again, I can ask what's the probability of tunneling between you know, some, some shell of quark gluon plasma which, and, 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 you know, the, and, and the thermal things. And if this is, again, it's a calculation, it's a calculation which, which one can do, but you know, I, I think it can still be important. I mean, nobody has built these things in the bulk for, for ADS. Yes, Arias. Uh, the Mathur picture uh, assumes that all microstates are semi-classical. How? No. Matur says there's something at the horizon, and whatever something at the horizon is will have this entropy. It doesn't say anything about semi-classical or not. Semi-classical is what we are doing in Saclay and in, at USC with Nick, because you know those are the solutions we are building. So right, right now we are doing semi-classical. I'll, I'll come at the end. But the question is whether this conclusion and calculation uses semi-classical, uses that all of these things are semi-classical or not. The mature calculation is very generic. It's just saying when you, when you have a black hole, if you expect it to the, e to the s solutions, which have black hole size, which are just solutions of string theory. A concrete solution, a concrete calculation. So concrete calculation, the one we have here, is using semi-classical solutions. The concrete calculation is using you know bubbling solutions, which have like you know big bubbles and so on and so forth. I need to keep it un un under control. So my, my calculation is really like you know classical solution with like you know go you know semi-classical solutions with like you know brain tunneling and so on and so forth. Matur is saying something very generic. He's just saying generically you expect the shell to be size to be the, of the size of the black hole, and you know the area the action is of this order, and therefore this is of order e to the e to the minus s. But it could be you know if there's a factor of five here, it doesn't work. You, know, you need to compute the exact exponent. I mean, if, 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 this kind of heuristic calculations of Krauss and Matur, they are nice, but you know, in a real example, you have to compute the, you know, if the coefficient here is five and the coefficient here is one, this doesn't happen. It's really the exponents have to be the same. And that's something which, again, it, it's hard to, you know, you cannot play with error bars in the exponent. I mean, one has. Okay, so now I'll tell you a bit how, a, 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 a bit how we do this, how, how we build these solutions, and in particular, both the supersymmetric and especially the non-supersymmetric. Yes. You would like to claim that semi-classical low-energy observers can distinguish all these individual ETS microstates. Is, is, that, is that a statement you're going to make? The tunneling of the, uh, so the, the statement which I'm making is that when you have a shell of dust, it can tunnel into all of them. Now about observer, it's a different question. So the, about observer, I mean, I'll come towards the end. The question is about the shell of dust. The question is when you form the black hole. Because when you form the black hole, again, if you form the black hole, coming back here, if you form the black hole naively by collapsing a shell of dust, and you don't have these tunneling effects, you form a horizon, and then by the time anything can happen, any, any, any string theory can take over, any quantum effects can become important, you have to go back in time. You really have to go back in time to form this structure. And that's something which, now, there's another question, which is, you know, second order, which, is Jan, which Jan is asking, what's happening if after forming this stuff, there'll be an observer falling in and so on and so forth. The observer can either hit this configuration or it can actually tunnel. There's a big discussion about that. Uh, it has to do with fast comp complementarity. Kiriak also, I think, will have some things to say about that. So there's a secondary question, what's happening when, when an observer goes through? But for now, I mean, this is much more basic. This is just a shell of dust collapsing and forming the black hole. To form anything here, which is not a horizon, you have to tunnel. You, ha you have to tunnel. Because otherwise, or, or you have to go backwards in time, in time a million years, you know, up to you. Personally, I'd like to tunnel because, again, I don't, you know, 
I don't want quantum effects from a million years in the future to start affecting me now. I mean, I just, you know, okay, maybe it can happen. Maybe quantum mechanics is crazy, but, you know, I don't like that. You know, I, I just have my own, my own biases and so on. But, you know, quantum mechanics from, quantum effects from a million years, years in the future, I don't like them at all. That's, okay. So the question, so, okay, let's give some examples. So the first solutions to, to look at, again, if you're if you a string theorist and you're constructing solutions, you're looking for solutions which have a black hole size, but no horizon. The best is to use supersymmetric black holes and supersymmetric solutions is the easiest because supersymmetric solutions are underlined by some linear system. So for example, if you take the, the black hole of Strominger Waffa, the three charge black hole in five dimensions, um, this black hole can actually be replaced. So you can actually argue that there's a solution which has the same charges as the black hole and the same fluxes. And this solution can be found in, uh, in, 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 in five dimensional supergravity. And the easiest is to look at, um, so again, the black hole is, um, has, has a base, is a solution which, which is built uh, by taking some sources in, in an R4 base. And you can find black hole microstates, again, horizonless configurations, by replacing by this, uh, this R4 base by some four dimensional hyperkeller solution, by, by some four dimensional hyperkeller base. And in particular, one can choose a four dimensional base space, which is like this, which is given by, uh, by a Gibbons Hawking or, or by a tau knot um, space. So the black hole is given by a singularity in the horizon in R4, and the microstates come from replacing R4 by, again, by this hyperkeller space, and then building the solutions which are supersymmetric is not very hard. On this hyperkeller space, you have to find a self-dual two-form, which is, again, a straightforward calculation, and then you have uh, the black hole harmonic functions, which are given by this function z, which are sourced by the magnetic two-forms, and then there's some electric magnetic interaction which gives you some rotation. So usually when you have a pointing vector, when you have electric mag and, mag and magnetic fields, they give you some rotation. So there's a system which one has to solve. Again, you take a base space, which is again, which, which you can take to be a Gibbons Hawking or a Tau knot base space. You solve the system of equations, you eliminate singularities, you eliminate closed time like curves, and you find solutions, which again, do what you want. And especially when you have this four dimensional base space, this Gibbons Hawking base space, it was shown by Gaunter Tegutowski and also by me and uh, Per Krauss and Ikoner that the solutions on this base space are given by eight harmonic functions. What is the last equation you mean? This dk star dk? This dk, so k is the one form, the, the rotation one form. I haven't given it the metric. The k is the rotation one form. <coughs> and dk is a two form. And star dk is the, is the, is the host dual of that in four dimensions on the, on the base space. So this is a two form. And this is the magnetic two form times the scalar war factors. So, this, so, so the these are scalars, the these are just warp factors, and the these are two forms. So the last equation tells you that the rotation of the system... The right hand side, what is this meaning, the right hand side? The right hand side, you see, you have some electric fields, which are given by these ZIs in the solution. I'm not giving, I'm, I'll, I'll show the solution a bit later. You have some magnetic fields, which are basically given by these Gs. And the, the, the intuition behind, behind the right hand side is that when you have an electric field and a magnetic field, you have a pointing vector, which gives you rotation. So the rotation comes because you have electric mag and magnetic fields which, which, have, which are crossed. That's the intuition behind this term. But these terms are obtained by just solving supersymmetry variations in this particular space time. So, this, so these equations are obtained you know, quite painfully by solving supersymmetry variations. I'm just giving you the finite, the finite form. So when you take a base space to begin on Hawking, it's very, easy to, uh, it's, it's very easy to construct solutions. And in particular, one can take a Gibbons Hawking space which has many, many centers which are again, which can again have plus and minus signs. Between all these two centers, there's a, there's a two form. Um, okay, this is hard, uh, there's a, if you look here, you see when, when the function v has a pole. When the function v has a pole, v to the minus one goes to zero. So this fiber psi shrinks to zero at the pole of v. So when v has many, many poles, you have a, you have a u1 fiber which shrinks to zero at all these poles, and therefore there are non-trivial two cycles between all these poles. So between all these poles, there are many, many non-trivial two cycles. And one can actually construct solutions. I'll tell you a bit later how these solutions come about. One can construct solutions very easily, which have, again, many, many two fluxes, many, many two cycles, topological. And they have fluxes wrapping these, uh, wrapping these solutions. And these solutions have the same mass and charge and angular momentum and the size as the black hole. Now, why do we have that? What's the, what, what, what's the intuition behind these solutions? So again, you have this, uh, you had a black hole before, and I'm replacing the black hole by forming bubbles and by having magnetic flux wrapping the bubbles. Now you can ask, okay, great, I have this configuration of bubbles and fluxes. Why do, why does it look, does it look like a black hole? Where's the black hole charge coming from? To see the black hole charge is very easy. This is some five-dimensional supergravity, 
which have terms of the, of the type f wedge f wedge a. That's the term in, in the Lagrangian of five-dimensional supergravity. And the charge is the coupling to A0. And when you have magnetic fluxes, you see that in the Lagrangian there are terms which contain two magnetic fields sourcing A0. So your charge is sourced not by singular objects, not behind horizons. When you have a black hole, for example, the charge comes from behind the horizon. And, you know, the, charge, the, the flux line comes come outside from the, from the horizon. Here, the charge is sourced ba by basically having these magnetic fields. You can ask where is the black hole mass coming from. That's easy. You know, we have all, the, all these electric and magnetic fields. They have energy, and therefore, they, uh, they give you the mass. Where is the angular momentum coming from? It's coming from pointing vectors. It's coming, it's coming from E cross B. And you see that when you have an A0, you have an F01, for example, and then you have an F12 magnetic. And therefore, this is going to give you some angular momentum in the 0, 2 direction. So the angular momentum of these configurations comes from basically fluxes talking to each other, electric and magnetic fluxes talking to each other. That's the intuition. Of course, you know, I can, you know, I, I can, I can spend the whole hour explaining how these solutions are. I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is quite a bit of work. I'm just trying to give you a, a, a bit of a feeling. If you have more questions and so on, I know, you know, that the solutions in the papers. Now, these microstates actually they form uh, black hole solitons. There's a funny story. When I first came to France, uh, I gave a talk here. Thibault and uh, Gary Gibbons remember. I gave a talk in IHS, and I explained these solutions. And you know, we had just found them, and we were very happy. And then Thibault and Gary Gibbons started grilling me. And because you know, I, I, there are various things which I didn't understand about the solutions, and so on and so forth. And they grilled me so much. I remember exiting the room and you know, walking through the IHS campus. And I was like, oh my god, maybe these things are wrong. Maybe all these things which I've been doing over, over the past two or three years are, are, are just wrong. I mean, I was so shaken by the, all the questions they asked me. I mean, it was just you know, bombardment. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, but then, um, and then you know, Gary kept on exchanging emails with Gary. And then Nick and Gary, they got together and they started to understand these things you know, really from a hardcore uh, GR perspective, you know, you know, more formal. The way we had them was like, you know, more like, you know, hand, you know, hand waving American, you know, West Coast, East Coast, you know, things. And you know, they really got like a European frame of mind. Okay, let's understand those things, like you know, thoroughly. You know, let, let's get all the all the problems. And the problem is, that those are black hole solitons. I mean, the, these solutions, if you if you think about them, they are they, again, they have black hole charge and mass and angular momentum, but they have no horizon. They're called black hole solitons. And there's a whole slew of theorems from like you know 20 30 years ago forbidding black hole solitons saying that black hole solitons should not exist in four dimensions and you know and all these theorems and you know basically uh, Nick and Gary they basically found all the story behind them you know why these solitons are allowed you know what's the bug in these theorems is they, 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 there's a, there's a very very beautiful gr story behind them so you know if you want to if you really are a gr inclined person who likes you know who, who likes this kind of things you know this is the place this is the place to read if you're a string theory, more personal, okay, here's a brain, here's another brain, like me, then okay, this is, you know, this is this may be too formal for you, but you know, for, for hardcore people who are who like who like a, a GR understanding of this, this is this is this is the paper. And again, the reason I mean uh, I mean and you know, this uh, I think I think the place where this started was you know in IHS, you know, uh, ten years ago when when I gave uh, when uh, when I came to France. Those of you who know about holography in Klebanov Strassler, there's a similar system which appears again, this is just for the experts, you know, in Klebanov Strassler, there's a charge in magnetic fluxes, and again magnetic magnetic fluxes can carry, can carry electric charge. Now, the difference between these solutions and the black hole is that the classical black hole solution has two scales. It has the, I mean, you, you, on one hand, you have the mass, which gives you the horizon size, and then you have the Planck size. These solutions are different. These solutions, they stop the space-time above the horizon. So they have two more scales involved. A normal black hole, again, has you know, just two scales. You know, it has the mass and the Planck length. This solution has two more scales. There's a scale where, which tells you how far away from the horizon you are stopping the space-time. Because again, the, the solutions don't have a horizon, so you, know, because you, you, so, so you are capping the space-time above the horizon. And there's a, something which, which you can think about as, 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 the, as, as the maximum redshift, or the redshift from the bottom of the throat. And this is something which we call Z-max. And you know, for a black hole, the redshift is infinite. You, know, you cannot put stuff there. But on these solutions, you can. You can, put some, you, you can put some stuff here, and you can, you can calculate you know, what's the mass. If I put you know, one, one milligram of mass here, you know, how much do you see at infinity? And this is the maximum redshift. So that's, and that's a scale which these solutions have, and the black hole doesn't have. But there's another scale which has to do with the size of the bubbles. The only thing I told you is that I have topological cycles with flux. But I haven't told you how big the cycles are. The cycles could be one Planck length each, and you know, they could have many, many bubbles, which are all one Planck length each. Or you can have like you know one bubble which is you know mega big and huge, and th there are many and you know and then you can have everyth ev everything in between and all these configurations again all these possibilities we can build solutions for all of them again some of them are going to have more entropy some of them are going to have le less entropy we don't know but this is a way to parameterize and roughly speaking the size of the bubble has to do with how much flux you put on it 
In a sense, the flux blows up the bubble. In a because you have flux, it's the, the flux makes the bubble large. So the more flux you put, the bigger the bubble becomes. The more, the, the more, the, the more magnetic flux you put on a two cycle, the bigger the bubble becomes. That's the intuition, but again, more, there are many calculations to, uh, to support them. So this is nice and beautiful. I mean, again, we have all these solutions, you know, which have, you know, which look like a black hole. They have the same features, but they don't have entropy. They don't have too much entropy. Why, do, why don't they have entropy? The reason is very stupid. We started from a Gibbons Hawking space, and you look for a solution to the Gibbons Hawking isometry. If you look at the molecules in this room, which have an isometry, you will grossly underestimate the entropy. Again, the typical microstate of this room has molecules going around in all directions with all speeds. If I'm looking at only the molecule configuration which have some isometry, where the molecules go in a circle or something, and I ask what's the entropy of those, I'll grossly misestimate. I'll, I'll really underestimate the entropy. The most generic states should not have should not have isometries. And again, the solution that you build, uh, they are basically, they have, they have isometries. Now the problem is in this game, the balance is the following. The more isometries you put, the easier it is to build a solution. So if you put many isometries, the solution is easy. If you put few isometries, the solution is hard. But then if you want to get entropy, you have to put, you, you have to put few isometries. So somehow the best is, is the, the, hard, the, the state of the art is to really find the balance between finding solutions which are simple enough to be able to build and analyze, and complicated enough to be able to get some entropy out of them. That's somehow the balance. So one has to build more generic configurations. There's a way to build them. There are some objects in string theory called super tubes, which actually can have arbitrary shape and still be super symmetric. And we build these configurations. We're able to put super tubes in these configurations. It's a tau knot space. Uh, Don has uh, found the Green's functions for tau knots for uh, scalars and vectors. You know they're very painful. We use them to find these solutions. It was a really painful piece of work. And we got the super tubes and so on and so forth. And we found them to be smooth. And we found an entropy out of them. I mean, you can calculate how much entropy this super tube ha has. And it comes like q to the five halves to the to the one quarter. So it's really q to the five quarters. Now that's a lot of entropy. First of all, you should be highly impressed because I mean I'm getting e to the e to this number worth of solutions. So that's a huge number of solutions which you are getting, but it's not enough. The black hole q is the total charge. Q is the total charge, yes. So the total so so the entropy scales like q to the five quarters. The black hole entropy, the three charge black hole entropy scales like q to the three halves. So this is not really black hole like. So putting super tubes and doing you know page greens functions and you know all these calculations, this was the first attempt we had, and it was not it was not enough. And the reason was that in a sense these super tubes which you have here, they are given by some functions which are arbitrary, but somehow the number of functions determines how many degrees of freedom you have, and you need to have. So there's some when you come when you calculate this number, there's some Cardi formula. There's a Cardi formula, and in the Cardi formula, when you put super tubes and you, know, you look at the entropy they have, there's a central charge, which is equal to 8 for super tubes. Now, what we conjectured, and, and then, okay, we said, okay, let's look for more generic things. So, then, so Yan Debur and Masaki Shigemori and Nick and I started to look, look at more complicated string theory objects, which maybe have more degrees of freedom, because, again, super tubes are not enough. And we found this object, which we call the super stratum, which is like a super tube. So this is a super tube. For example, imagine having a D1 and a D5 uh, brain, which is straight. You can have these brains puffing up into a super tube, and then they become functions of one variable. But you can also have these brains wiggle in this direction by a momentum wave, and then puff up. And in general, there should be more, a more compl complicated configuration, which we call the super stratum, which should depend on functions of two variables. Now, function of two variables are given by an infinite number of, a function of two variables is an infinite number of functions of one variable, if you just think about Fourier coefficients. But of course, you know, when you have when you're thinking you have to quantize, so you really have naively classically C equals to infinity, but then you but then, but then you know once you quantize, you find that you know function of two variables, you know, th there's a finite number of them, so there's a finite number of degrees of freedom. And this object we conjecture them to exist, first of all, and to be smooth. And we are using this uh, architectural version, this some some tower in uh, uh, Qatar, I think, which is called the, 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 the Strata Towers. So you know, this is the architectural version. Unfortunately, building those things is quite hard. So this is what actually architecture people build. So there's a difference between conception and you know, implementation. Unfortunately for us, it was the same. You know, it was very complicated to build these solutions, uh, but you know, we, ha we have been able to we have been able to build them. But this is the kind of object which, which, which you expect. You, if you want to get black hole-like entropy, you need to have functions of two variables. You, it's not enough to have it's not enough to have just super tubes and and so on. You really have to do more even more complicated um, stuff. How did you build these objects? Well, if you think about a super tube, it's like just, just again a, a, a circle in R4. But if you think about R4 as a Gibbons Hawking space, or if you think about Tom Knot, for example, a super tube is just something wrapping as an object 
which is wrapping the isometry direction of the Gibbons Hawking fiber, which is wrapping, wrap, wrap, wrapping the Talmot fiber. So this is really a, um, um, a Talmot space, and the supertube is an object wrapping this Talmot fiber. Well, there's another direction in the game, which is the direction of the D1 and the D5 brain. Again, we're trying to get the storm of black hole, which has D1, D5, and P charges. There's a common D1, D5 direction, which I'm calling here to be V. And in our solutions, there's a solution for the supertube where this V direction, which is large at the location of the, black, of the D1 and the D5, becomes zero at the location of the supertube. And the psi direction, which is big at the location of the supertube, becomes zero at the origin of the Gibbons Hawking space. And you see that you have in the system a three sphere, because again, when you have a U1, which is big at, at one point and small at some other, and another U1, which is big at some point and small at some other, this gives you a three sphere. And the superstrata, which we are trying to build, again, there are some supertube solutions found ages ago by Lulin and Matur and by Lulin, Madassan, and Maoz, which depend on psi. You can so get solutions which depend on V pretty, pretty, pretty easily. And we're able to, to, to build solutions which are parameters by function of two variables by arbitrary functions f of psi and v. And that's something which, and that, and that's something which um, we, we did two, uh, two years ago. Wow, OK? Two years ago, uh, and we call this paper Habemur Superstratum. We were so happy that we found these things. I mean, you know, after, after, quite, after quite a while, uh, after, after several years of, um, of trying. It was, it was a really painful process building the solutions, again, function of two variables. Now, why was it so hard for us? When Jan and Masaki and Nick and I con conjectured the superstrata, it was in, in 2011. And it took us you know, four years to find them. Now, normally in Sakle, we tend to be a bit faster. We, we have quite a few postdocs, and you know, we usually do things much faster. The problem is that if you look at these microstates of the black holes, the black hole has three charges. And they are all, all the microstates we should build, they are built in some U1 cube uh, supergravity in five dimensions. So again, five dimensional supergravity, is a, the, there's a huge family of them. But we looked at one particular truncation, which is a U1 cube supergravity. And when you're trying to get wiggles on the supertubes, you're getting singularities. But then there, was two there were two calculations, one of them done by Taylor and Scandalis and Kanye Schneider using precision holography, and the other one done by um, David uh, Turton and uh, Rodolfo and Stefano Giusto using string emission. And these calculations told us that based on microscopic string theory calculations, there should be another U1. There should be another U1. So even if the black hole only has three charges and you have three magnetic charges, there must be generically another, another U1. Again, we had this um, like deep guys who do string theory and who thinks about you know, string emission calculations. They told us you know, there is another U1. There must be another field. And you must use a theory which is at least U1 to the four supergravity. And then there's a very nice physics which happened. Essentially, you have some singular configuration of warp factors. And there's some other singular configuration of this extra field. And even if both of them are singular, their singularities cancel. And the metric only depends on this particular, on this particular combination. And the full solution is smooth. So it was really, it was really a, a nice input from string theory hard work calculations, which told us you, know, you have to look for these particular microstates and made our life easy. And the fact that exactly the same field which string emission calculation and precision holography spit out comes out to, be, to make our life smooth, you know, this was really, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I really think it's, it's indicating that we are, we are zooming in on the, right, on the right physics. So, and by the way, just to impress you, this is the largest family of solutions known, known to mankind. The solutions of two variables, it's functions of two variables which are arbitrary. So you give me any function of two variables you want, I, I give you the solution. So it's really, it's, it, you know, th this is really the largest class of solutions known to mankind, and this is this, this parameter I, I was telling you about. Now, you can, also get, you can also get superstrata. I'm going to go a bit faster because I'll, I'll, I want to get to non-supersymmetric black holes. You can also get superstrata which have a long throat, um, which are again, which look again like, like, like flat space and ADS3, and then they have a, a long ADS2 throat. Uh, you can also count the entropy, but I'm going to go a bit faster because I mean, you know, it's really that you know, using these configurations, you can you can really argue that you have the right you, you have the right ingredients. And essentially, there's a lot of work to do, but you know, I think it's more at the level of dotting the i's and crossing the t's rather than you know understanding what the fundamental physics is. I think we really have the we really have the fundamental physics. Now, okay, this I'll go through. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about the MSW. I want to get to the, um, so essentially the super, the super symmetric microstate story which you have is that again we have this huge number of solutions and they basically are dual to some CFT states which, which, which look to be typical. I mean again we have many arguments, we have many arguments about them and moreover there are two calculations uh, which are done at intermediate stage between Stromager Waffa with zero gravity and our calculation of, with full gravity which also are supporting that you know black hole microstates come from these particular configurations and Essentially, I think I, I really think we are on the right track. 
Now, I want to get two words about quantum gravity in ADS2, because again, everybody and their, bro and their brother nowadays is doing ADS2, so like, hey, everybody's trying to understand why is quantum gravity in ADS2, uh, and you know, what's the implication of these things for quantum gravity in ADS2? Now, why is it difficult to do quantum gravity in ADS2? ADS2 is the most generic near horizon geometry of, 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 of extremely black holes. And when you have an ADS2 space and you want to add an, uh, an excitation in ADS2, you find that you cannot. This excitation either screws up the UV or screws up the infrared. You cannot have localized excitations in ADS2. And the fact that, so we either get a UV singularity or you get, a, you get an IR singularity. But there's something in SYK which I think is related to the fact that the four point function in, in SYK is not conformal invariant. This is really coming because, in a sense, when you have an operator, you back react it, you destroy the conformality, you destroy the ADS structure. The ADS structure does not remain when you take an object and you back react it. Now, this is the nice, this is the story about ADS2, which is a nice and beautiful story, but we know that in string theory, singularities are solved. And we have 20 years of experience of like, you know, singularity solving in string theory, and we know how singularities are solved. They are solved by extra strings and brain dynamics, which involves extra dimensions. And if you look at, and if you look at the typical microstates which we have, again, we have, we have some microstates, and these microstates have a long throat, have a throat which can become longer and longer and longer. And there's a nice limit which one can take, which is pretty straightforward, which involves essentially chopping off this flat space and getting a solution which is just ADS2, and then ending up in some cap. And essentially, all the black hole microstates which we have been building until now, all the superstrata and all these scalings, all, all the solutions which, which we have been building for the past you know, 12 years, especially the ones which, are, which have a long throat, which is again a, which, which is again a, a very important feature, which I think, which I think is, is crucial, all these solutions, they have a limit in which they become ADS2. And moreover, all the information in these solutions, again, the solutions are built by some Fourier modes and some fluxes and so on and so forth. All the information, all the, all the, all the counting of these solutions goes over into ADS2. So if you solve this problem, which you have, that you know, we're trying to build all the black hole microstates to get the entropy and so on and so forth, you also solve the problem of ADS2 gravity because you're getting all these solutions which have, again, an ADS2 throat. So for example, this BTZ microstate, again, there's a limit in which you basically have all the microstate structure and then you have just have ADS2 uh, going on forever. And you basically find all the states of quantum gravity in ADS2. You, 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 so there's a, there's a quantum mechanics dual to ADS2, and each and every ground state of this quantum mechanics is dual to one of these solutions. So if you solve the problem, if you solve the problem of black hole counting using these microstates, you also solve, again, ADS2. You also understand what's happening in, a, in ADS2. So how did this avoid this fragmentation issue? Uh, this is not fragmentation. This is basically um, fragmentation comes from f from taking two supersymmetric uh, black holes and and, and 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 moving them at a distance. Here you basically have just a bubble at the bottom of the space. So in fragmentation you have an ADS2 which is breaking up into two ADS2s. It's is the topology in the IR which is different. In fragmentation you really have an S. You really have some space which is breaking up into is like breaking up in, into pants. This is really closing up in this topology. And then if you want to put a wave, for example, in these ADS2s again coming back to here. Um, if you want to put a wave in this ADS2, you can put it. But you know, the wave, you know, if you put some particle here, it will just have some wave, and you know, the, the wave is going to be eaten up by this topology. So you know, it's pretty straightforward to get it's pretty straightforward to get to get this ADS2, you know, to put particles in this. Uh, so essentially, again, the story for supersymmetric is that again we have Stromage of Alpha, there are two calculations in between, and we have our, our microstates configuration. But it looks like again for supersymmetric black holes. All the entropy comes from, again, horizonless configurations, which remain horizonless all the way through. There's no horizon. There's never any horizon. And essentially, again, so, so again, for supersymmetric black holes, we are basically arguing that the, 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 that the black hole solution is just a thermodynamic um, explanation. And there's a similar story for supersymmetric, for non-supersymmetric and extremal black holes, which I, I'm not having time to go into. I mean, there's a lot of work which we've been doing also with Monica and other people about the Kerr black holes. There's, many, there are many, th th there's a similar story that, again, when you have these black holes, you can replace their horizon very easily. But again, uh, the question which Thibault was asking me before, okay, black holes are beautiful and they're supersymmetric, but they are extremal. And if you think about the extremal black hole Penrose diagram, which you know, I'm just giving you a slice here, what you are saying that the extremal black hole Penrose diagram, you have this singularity, and we are basically saying that this region doesn't make any sense, the region which is, which is here in, in, in blue, and therefore there's some quantum effects coming up and destroying the horizon you know, here. However, this is not so strange. If you think about it you know, from, a, from a GR perspective, you have, an, you have a singularity here. The singularity can emit you know, elephants, and the elephants can destroy the space time in this region. So, some people are saying, okay, great, you guys are doing some amazing stuff for extremal supersymmetric black holes. 
where, you know, again, this happens, but this is not so strange. You know, people in GR, you know, people, there are many people in, in the GR community who hate extremal black holes. Uh, even when Stromanger and Waffa had their nice black hole uh, mi micros mi micros microscopic counting, they say, oh, you, you, you string theorists are just doing extremal black holes, but, you know, real black holes are not extremal. So this is just a freak of nature, and, you know, non-extremal black holes are going to be mu much more different, and they'll have different physics. And so, again, what's the big deal? This is some hardcore GR people. They, they say, okay, what's the big deal about doing only extremal, only extremal black holes? The big deal about these calculations is that if you look at, you know, again, quantum information arguments, uh, that, you know, there's something at the horizon in order to preserve unitarity, these quantum information arguments are telling you that you only have a black hole. This is the naive space time. You could have the singularity resolved in two ways. You could have the singularity emitting some garbage and you know, destroying this region of the space time, but you, know, you still have an outer horizon and you still have you know, some space time between the outer and the inner horizon. Or you could have this, you could have the singularity and you could have the space time actually messed up here. And again, this is backwards in time from where the singularity is forming, but in order to resolve, in order to preserve uh, qu quantum mechanics, this structure needs to be actually here. So when you go from extremal to non-extremal, instead of, <coughs> So this structure, which is here at the inner horizon, it should go all the way to the outer horizon. It should not stay stuck to the inner horizon. Again, if the structure only stays to the inner horizon, we, we, you know, we, we found a nice, beautiful formal question. We, we answered the five, uh, a nice, beautiful formal question, but not the real question about black holes, which is, again, how can I find the structure at the outer horizon? And however, to do non-extremal black holes, and that's complicated because, you know, how can I argue that such a structure, one has to build lots and lots of su su such solutions. You know, again, for supersymmetric black holes, I told you that I can build a huge amount of them. For non-supersymmetric one, life is much harder. And the reason is that, you know, you have second, no second order no nonlinear PDEs in the best of cases. And it's just Einstein equations, which would like, you know, functions of two variables. You know, it took her, you know, 50 years to find the first, e even a black hole solution. What we're talking here is like, you know, way, 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 way more complicated stuff. And, you know, it's very hard to do. So. There's a Romanian proverb, uh, which is, you know, do not pray to the saint who doesn't help you. Um, and essentially, when you cannot find all these solutions, there's a way to do it perturbatively. So you can say, great, I have a, I have a supersymmetric microstate, which is, again, a supersymmetric black hole microstate. I can add an object, which is called an antibrain, to these solutions. And this antibrain is actually going to give me a, a metastable minimum. And this configuration of a supersymmetric solution with a non-supersymmetric object, with a non-supersymmetric probe, will actually be a microstate of a near supersymmetric black hole. So you can go, you can go not far from extremality, but near extremality. I can, I can find near extremal microstates. And I can actually argue that, you know, essentially when you have these near extremal microstates, they have the right features. For example, these antibrains can have something called brain flux annihilation. They are very common in string cosmology. Those of, those of you who do, who do string cosmology, who know about string cosmology, these antibrains are the bread and butter of string cosmology. And essentially, these antibrains will decay by brain flux annihilation, which corresponds to Hawking radiation. And you can find black hole microstates, again, of near extremal black holes using this method. This is one way to go around, and it's, again, cheap, you know, cheap but you know, we're getting a huge amount of, of microstates of near extremal black holes. And there's another way, there's another Romanian proverb, uh, which is that, you know, when a, when a bird is blind, sometimes God makes its uh, nest, and sometimes you can actually be lucky. And actually, Guillaume and Stefanos Kadmatas, they actually found a system when you can actually find the non-supersymmetric, non-extremal solutions which can actually be solved by solving a linear system. This is quite amazing. I still don't know how they did it. I mean, it involves, you know, nil potent alg algebra and stuff, which only Guillaume understands, and I think Stefanos also. But it's really some amazing piece of stuff. There are some solutions which, which one can build in gravity in five dimensions, which are non-supersymmetric, non-extremal. And we're able to build such solutions which have, you know, multiple cycles and so on and so forth. And these solutions, in principle, they can take us far away from extremality. They can really give us non-extremality. I think the most recent one, which Guillaume and David and Stefan are building, has 18% like, you know, non-extremal. So you know, one can really go away from extremality by a finite amount. They're not doing only near extremal by like, you know. Uh, much bigger, 700%. OK, 700%. OK, so you can really go away from extremality, like really a big distance away from extremality. And those are, again, solutions which are built not by solving Einstein's equations of two variables, but by solving a subsystem which is actually linear and which, which one can solve in a pretty straightforward way. Okay, straightforward means like, you know, you know, tons of tons of work and, you know, those guys, you can ask them, I mean, you know, they've been, they've been on the computer, you know, do, doing all these calculations. I mean, and, you know, the solutions are mega, are mega big, but one can go away from non-extremal. It's really amazing. I mean, if, 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 if you know, if I had thought, you know, and again, it's really this problem that, you know, you, you have no idea and sometimes, you know, you bump into, you know, you are really lucky. And this particular system is really amazing that you can really find solutions away from maximality, non-supersymmetric with multiple cycles. 
And the question is, okay, how far from externality can I go? How genetic do others want to be? Do they correspond to antibrains? Looks like there's a link between them and antibrains. It's really, it's, it's really that you know this, this this field. So right now we really have solutions. We really have there's a really a, machin a machinery to go away from extremality and to generalize all this story to non-extremal black holes. So I expect those to be very unstable. <coughs> yes, and I'm coming to that. Very important. Very good question. I'm really coming to that. So for near extremality. What we expect, at least, is that we have re resolution backward in time. And we have a way to argue that even far away from extremality, again, you have this kind of structure. You are replacing the black hole horizon, but not only the inner horizon, but all the way to the outer horizon, you are replacing this with, with some structure. Now, the big question which I asked you before, why is this, it, why is this thing not, not collapsing? And I told you about you know, this paper by uh, Gary Gibbons and by uh, Nick Warner explaining you that you know, there's a mechanism and you know, there's basically some, uh, there's, a, th there's a way to, to argue that, that, uh, that, that, that this is the only way to build back on microstates. What's happening is the following, you have some cycles and, have th and there's a flux on them. The flux is quantized, you have 17 quanta. If you make the cycle very small, the energy of the flux on it becomes big. So what's keeping the cycles from collapsing is the fact that you have cycles with, with a quantized flux on them, which don't want to shrink because shrinking costs energy. So even if there's a gravitational attraction pulling you in, there's a flux on these, quant on these cycles which actually pulls you out, and it's the flux which keeps you from collapsing. And the nice thing about this paper by uh, Gibbons and Warner is that you can argue that you know, essentially from a, if, you, if you want to build um, so solutions of, of gravity or, or, or of supergravity, you can argue that the only mechanism, the only mechanism to avoid collapse in a semi-classical limit is by doing bubbling. You cannot build a black hole soliton otherwise. You must have topology. Black hole solitons need topology, and this is really at the level of a theorem. So this is really like you know hardcore calculation, and it's not only about supersymmetric black holes. This is also about any type of black holes you want. So if you want to build any any black hole soliton, which has a semi-classical description, those guys tell you that the only way to do it is to have bubbling. So when people say that you know they are replacing the black hole by some quantum phase or by some Dwali uh, things which have like you know quantum effects and so on and so forth, and we, 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 you can always say, okay, great, I'm replacing the black hole by some big quantum mass. Well, great, there's a quantum mass. If in this quantum mass, any state in this E to the S dimension quantum mass is classical or semi-classical, which hopefully one expects. Again, I don't want, when I have E to the 10 to the 90 states, I don't want all of them to be quantum and with no classical limit for, uh, for any of them. If any state is going to be classical, it must be one of these solutions. It, if any state is semi-classical, so you can say, okay, all states are going to be quantum and so on and so forth, maybe. But if anywhere in this Hilbert space there's one state which is classical, it must look like this. So this is so so so, 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 so this theorem is, is again very is very powerful. From a from a from a lower dimensional perspective, there's another question. Okay, why do we avoid this uh, no go no go theorems about about, about about this matter? If you think about compactifying these cycles with fluxes, two strings in, 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 in to, this is this is all done in M theory. This is all done in, in, in eleven dimensions. If you think about going to four dimensions or to to to, to, to ten dimensional string theory on on a Calabiao. The reason why these fluxes don't collapse is that when you compactify the solutions, you end up with some objects which have negative mass and negative charge from a lower dimensional perspective. In string theory, they're nice. They're just you know, some, some bubbles in M theory. But when you go down to type 2 a string theory, they become negative mass, negative charge objects. Those objects are common in string theory. Again, you have oriented folds, which, for example, have negative mass and negative charge. But this is why they don't collapse. The reason why they don't collapse from a 4D perspective is that they really have, they are, they are a highly unusual form of matter, which again comes from compactifying string theory. It's very natural to obtain this kind of unusual form of matter when you compactify string theory to, um, to four dimensions, again, when you compactify these smooth solutions. But it's not the kind of matter which you'd normally put. I told you before that you, know, you have to put something at the horizon, all the stuff falls in. Yes, all the stuff falls in except this stuff. And this stuff, again, comes from compactifying cycles, and it really has negative mass and negative charge. This is really the feature of this stuff. And in string theory, it's perfectly natural. If you want to replace the black hole horizon by usual stuff, you know, by dust or by, by stuff, usual matter doesn't hang around. It just falls in the black hole. It's, it, you need to have this highly unusual type of matter to stay at the horizon. But string theory provides it for you. The string theory really, really provides you this kind of matter which can stay at the horizon. And what about other black holes? Well, if I give you this Penrose diagram and ask you what does this black hole represent, is it really a near extremal black hole or is it a Schwarzschild black hole which has one electron? Answer is it's the same Penrose diagram. A Schwarzschild black hole with one electron has exactly the same Penrose diagram as a near extremal black hole. So if you argue that in string theory this can happen for near extremal black holes, 
It's also possible that you know maybe this also happens for Schwarzschild. I don't have microseeds. I don't have a solution. Again, hopefully, uh, with Guillaume and David, you know, and, and Stefan also, we are pushing towards you know far away from externality, and you know, hopefully, we're getting there. But at this point, I don't have. If you ask me for a Schwarzschild microseed, microseed, I, I, I cannot give it to you. So the only thing which you have are near extremal and some far away from externality. But again, if you just think about the Penrose diagrams, it's, it's, it's exactly the same, the, the, the same Penrose diagram. If this phenomenon happens in one corner of string theory, why not happening in some other? I mean, I expect it to be. I expect it to be there. Just one second, I'm, and I'm finished. So. And again, then you can ask, okay, what about the real Schwarzschild solution? Well, I mean, if this happens, you know, just take the electron away and you get the Schwarzschild solution. So that's not a big state. So right now, essentially, there are four approaches. Again, you know, just to just to just to get a bit of, of, of a global view, there are four approaches that pure black hole states have no horizon. On one hand, you have information theory-based arguments, Matur first, which is 2009, and then AMPS, following that, arguing that there's a firewall or not. Um, and, but that's a secondary question. Again, you know, it's the, the question, the, the real question is, you know, do you have garbage at the black hole horizon or not? Do you have something there, anything? And the arguments based on information theory that you must have something there. The arguments based on generic ADS-CFT, Kiriakos is against, uh, but you know the arguments based on generic ADS-CFT that you know a black hole, um, uh, there should be something, a typical state should have non-trivial webs, and therefore there should be it should have no spherical symmetry, and therefore no horizon. The arguments using ADS-CFT, but just very generic arguments. Nobody really has one solution. And those are really agnostic about the theory. These arguments, they could happen in loop quantum gravity, they could happen in whatever dynamical triangulation you have. Those are really generic arguments having to do with any theory of gravity whatsoever that something must, at the must be happening at the horizon. And then you have two string theory ways of doing it. You can either think of, say, okay, let's take stromanger Waffa. I'm at weak coupling. I'm following microstates from weak to strong coupling towards the black hole regime. And there are, again, some calculations called black hole deconstruction, so the string emission calculation, which, which Rodolfo and uh, Stefano Giusto and uh, David Turton are doing. Uh, there's a Higgs column map, which I worked on with, with, with Jan and Shear and um, other people. There are, many, there are many approaches arguing that when you, when you go from weak coupling to the gravity regime of parameters, you have some configuration which grows. Some results are, are inconclusive, but you know, I think there's an overall, there's an overall feeling that you know, this, the, you, you're going to get this kind of thing. And the other option is to just build all these black hole microstates, which again are forming, are forming black hole solitons. And the mechanism I gave you is bubbling. Again, you have these classical solutions and so on. But to answer Elias' really question, which he asked me, he asked me okay, what, what, what about curvature? Why do you know that you know, this is not going to be stringy and stuff? This bubbling mechanism which you have, you can actually extrapolate it. When the, when, when the bubbles become very small, it, this goes into something called brain polarization, which, which you can also study. So there are basically many regions of parameters in string theory where, where you can study this phenomenon. And it's, so, if this, uh, so, so, so this bubbling support mechanism actually extrapolates even, even far away from the region where you, where you trust uh, low, energy, low, energy, low energy supergravity. So that's basically, so that's basically um, the situation. And the question which everybody asks me is like, first of all, you know, are all the microsets going to be classical? Answer is I have no idea. Hopefully not, maybe yes. What I hope is that the classical solutions will form a basis to understand some generic features of the Hilbert space. That's my hope. But again, that's, some, that's a calculation to be done. It's not something which I, can just, which I can just tell you now, OK, it's classical or not. I have to calculate the black hole entropy. I don't have, we, we, don't have yet, we don't have it yet. There's another question which has to do with Costas's question um, about antibrains and about these solutions of, of, of non extremal black holes. Um, we've been saying in Saclay for many, many years that antibrains are tachyonic and therefore they are very bad for cosmology and therefore you don't get a decita landscape. And you know, we, we've been doing all this, all this work on antibrains, arguing that antibrains are tachyonic. And for cosmology, this is horrible because it implies that a universe built with antibrains is, is unstable. But for black holes, this is perfect because when you are looking at a non extremal black hole, you actually expect instabilities. And the reason is very stupid. If you think about the D25 system, you have left movers and you have right movers, which are giving you the non supersymmetric microstates. Those guys annihilate. And they annihilate and they emit Hawking radiation. So there's a generic argument by Matur that essentially, um, Non-supersymmetric microstates must be unstable. This is really a it's a feature, it's not a bug. If they are not unstable, then you are doing something wrong. And JMART is unstable, for example, and there are many calculations arguing that, and the ones which, which we're finding with Guillaume and David and Stefano are also unstable. So you can really argue that all these non-supersymmetric microstates must be unstable, and but that's something which makes a lot of sense in ADCFT. Again, you have right movers and left movers, they annihilate, they can emit Hawking radiation. But what, what's the point of counting? Subtle points, and you want to count class. They are spanning the Hilbert space. So if I can span the Hilbert space, why? If it's a, a classical, really unstable subtle. It doesn't matter. It's still a state. 
I'm trying to span the Hilbert space. Uh, so first of all, for non supersymmetric, I cannot count anything. I'm just just to be just to be. Um, but I think the, the, the point is, you know, if I want to understand, for example, you know, I have the CFT. In the CFT, I can build some non supersymmetric states. If I can imagine the, the, the CFT non supersymmetric states with bulk configurations, and I can argue that you know they have the same features, and uh, then you know I can argue that ADCFT tells me that you know all the typical states of the black hole will, will be such such configurations. And essentially, ADCFT tells me that if I have a non-extremal microstate, it must have instabilities. Sorry, but if you take the yeah. decoupling limit, then uh, it will be stable. Oh. Uh, ADS decoupling limit, then this addition to plus. Yes. And JMOD, for example, if you take a decoupling limit, it becomes pure ADS. Of course, the instability is only visible when you glue this microstate to flat space. It's not visible if you look at the, in the, in the, in the, in the decoupling limit, it's gone. That's you know, very good point. So JMOD, for example, if you take the decoupling limit, there's no more instability. The instability goes away. The instability only comes when you take JMOD and you glue it to, fla to, to, to flat space. V very good point. I didn't even. Um, what about non uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm basically. So, what about nonlinear instabilities? And again, this is something which people have been arguing that you know, essentially, these solutions have a nonlinear instability. There's a CFT calculation that you know this makes sense. And there's a big question everybody's asking: Can you fall through the black hole drinking your coffee? Uh, you know, is it really? Do you have firewalls or do you have fastballs or what's going on? And or do you go splat at the horizon size? And there are three options. You can either analyze infinite density shells, which are kept at the horizon by the tooth fairy, because again, nobody has any support mechanism. Or you can look at the solutions we have, which have a support mechanism. And you can try to ask this question. Or you can modify gravity by weird terms and analyze the horizon. Again, many people are doing many weird things. But the one to do is you know, to actually use the actual solutions. And so far, the answer is going to depend on this configuration. It depends on how many of these guys are, how typical they are, what's the entropy. It's really a lot, a lot of calculations, c calculations which one has to do. You cannot answer these hard questions by just hand waving and by arguing that I'm replacing the horizon by something and, and something else. And so far, I don't see any reason why these solutions can let you go through. David uh, d d disagrees. There's a question about, you know, can you see this structure when you have gravity wave collisions? Answer is maybe the structure of the horizon, when the, two, when the two black holes approach, they start messing up the structure of the horizon. If something is, is at the horizon and these two black holes are collapsing, you may have extra terms in the gravity wave, in the gravity wave um, calculation. And, you know, this can, have, this can mess up this curve which Thibault um, calculated. So that could be, you know, so, so this is even, even something which, is, which, which may be um, visible. So again, to summarize, we've seen the string theory has configurations which, which can hover above the horizon, and they have again topology and fluxes. And for supersymmetric microstates, again, we see that you know we have all these calculations that you know really you, you really have you really have um, this picture is correct. For non-extremal non-supersymmetric, we have a similar story. And when you go to non no, to non-extremal, you have to go to near-extremal or far from extremality with some help. Maybe there are some other ways of doing it using numerics or inverse scattering and so on and so forth. And again. Maybe if this term, if this physics at the horizon has an effect, which one can in principle calculate, it maybe it, it will affect gravity waves or, for example, make the supermassive black hole formation in, early, in the early, uh, early universe more likely. So I leave you here. Get. Uh, I'm stressed that uh, classical states are the only states that you can construct, and we're focusing on them. But would one expect that? Quantum effects are the dominant effect. I don't know how to do any calculation which involves quantum effects and gravity at the same time. So people are saying, okay, quantum effects, quantum effects, quantum effects, everybody's trying to replace the black hole by quantum effects at the horizon size. There is no calculation involving quantum effects and gravity at the, ho at the horizon scale, which anybody has ever done. But what I know is that when you have quantum stuff, again, everybody tries to hide. I mean, in this problem, I mean, there are many, many people who want to replace the black hole by something, and they say, oh, it's all quantum. Great, you have e to the s Hilbert space, e to the s dimensional Hilbert space. If in this Hilbert space there's even one solution which is classical, it must be this. So there is no, but, but, but again, if, but, but, so the problem is if you just do it in, in some random theory and you have a classical solution coming out, if it doesn't have d brains to give you low mass degrees, of, to give you this growth with, 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 with the horizon size, if it doesn't have e to the s entropy, if it doesn't have all these features, it doesn't work. So that's. Again, I'm, I'm very adamantly against arguing that, oh, you have quantum stuff, and then just hide behind the quantum stuff. I'm not disagreeing with that statement. Of course, I'm, agree I'm agreeing with that statement. What I am r a bit uh, worried about is stressing that classical states dominate uh, any mechanism. I don't know. It's a calculation. It's a calculation. I don't know. Classical state, because the classical states will form a horizon, as you said. No. No, 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 no. These classical states were not. These classical states involve topology and fluxes. They're, they're not from a horizon. What stops topology changing? Sorry? What stops topology changing transitions? Uh, in this particular example, which I'm computing, I have, I have a huge number of states. 
and I just calculate the tunneling into each and every one of them, and I get a number, and if my system wants to go into those states, you know, what can I do to it? But there are assumptions behind those calculations. Of, of course, no, no, sure, but again, all the states I have, I mean, I have all, I have all these solutions, and my, my tunneling, my system wants to tunneling to them. So, I mean, I, the, the question to ask is, like, you know, where does this, the, where, the, where does, does the collapsing shell want to go? And the answer is, it will not go into horizon, it will go into this. Gary, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to know your response to uh, uh, Harvey Real and his friends, who uh -huh. claim that because of the so-called evanescent ergo yes. uh, region, that your solutions will be unstable. Which is something that Nick and I did not address. Oh uh, no! So the point is, the evanescent ergo region comes from. Okay, I have it here. This is the question about nonlinear instabilities. So they argue that there's an evanescent ergo region, and therefore, if you look at the linear perturbation, there's no instability because you have, you have, you have a supersymmetric solution. But when you look at a nonlinear perturbation, so if you look again, if you think about you know, two perturbations on top of each other, then you get an instability. But this makes perfect sense because, again, what, what's, what's a nonlinear instability? It's really a, a, you, you put a linear perturbation, you back react it, and then you put another perturbation on top of it. But once you back react it, you, go, you, you build a non extremal configuration. So the fact that essentially this nonlinear instability is there is the same as saying that all the non-extremal microstates are, are unstable. But that's exactly what I want. The D1 D5 CFT tells me that's exactly what I want. I want the non the, uh, I want the nonlinear I, I want all the non-extremal microstates to be unstable because they have right movers and left movers on this effective string, which annihilate, which can hit each other and emit closed strings. So my, my understanding of this instability, I was very happy when they found the result. For me, this result just confirms the intuition, which again, Matur has been telling us for a long time, that non-extremal microstates must be unstable. And that's again a CFT calculation. And those guys are just confirming it using, again, this more fancy technology. So I'm, again, it's, it's a result which made, me, which made me very happy, despite what they, what they wrote in the paper. But, but what's the time scale of these? I mean, would they make astrophysical black holes go away much faster oh. than we see them last? Here, for example, so, so the, the problem is like, you know, this is all supersymmetric and near supersymmetric. So the only thing which I can do is a bit like in ADSQCD, I can make some estimates based on, you know, charges and so on. One thing which I know about the time scale is that, um, we, okay, where do I have this? If you think about, for example, two black holes collapsing uh, in the early universe, and there's a big problem about in the early universe about how to form supermassive black holes, because when you have a, black, a bunch of black holes going around each other, they collapse, they, you know, let's say they're all solar mass black holes, they collapse, they form a few black holes, but then the other ones get thrown out of the system, and you never form supermassive black holes. If, for example, because of this microstate structure, you have another term at the horizon, like some friction term, for example, this, this is again, huge string mass at the horizon scale. If this term has some friction, for example, then when two black holes go around each other, there's another channel to eat up the energy. The energy can be eaten up in these open string modes living in the system, and therefore the collapse may, may be more efficient, and therefore the gravity wave signature may, may be different, and may, it may be easier to form supermassive black holes. This being said, there's a calculation to be done which I haven't done. So I need to really build a few of those guys, and to really understand this calculation, I haven't done a calculation, so. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker.